Professor Andrew Harrison from Otago University joins us. And Andrew is a rheumatologist and the clinical head of the Wellington Regional Rheumatology Unit. Good afternoon, Andrew. Good afternoon, Jim. This has been reported on, silent, on Science Daily as, quote, some of the first evidence of how a cheaper antacid can encourage our spleen to promote an anti-inflammatory environment therapeutic in the face of inflammatory disease. So, you'll know all about this. Is this a discovery new, and is it true what they're claiming the potential regarding um, baking soda? I think it's a very interesting uh, discovery. It's, it's perhaps not entirely new in the sense that it's been known for a while that uh, giving patients with kidney disease uh, uh, antacids like sodium bicarbonate does seem to slow the rate of advance and, and in a way that can't be explained simply by changing the ratio of acid to alkali in the blood. Uh, and the researchers here speculated that there may be something happening in the stomach that is stimulating the spleen to change the way that, the, that certain cells are, are, are activated and perhaps to uh, increase the, uh, the frequency of, of cells that have anti-inflammatory uh, properties in the, in, the, in the blood. And so they, uh, they did the experiments in, in rats, giving them baking soda, and, uh, and sure enough, there was a change in the cell profile in a way that would suggest this could have an anti-inflammatory effect. In their study, they didn't look at the anti-inflammatory effect. They looked at the, at the uh, immunological profile. But they went on and did the same thing in humans, human volunteers who didn't have any particular disease, and found a similar favourable anti-inflammatory profile in their blood. Okay. And, uh, yes. A shift from inflammatory to an anti-inflammatory profile, basically. Yes. So, yes. what, uh, Andrew? What conditions would this assist with? Well, uh, a range of different uh, inflammatory diseases potentially. But what we really have to say to listeners is that this is very preliminary. It hasn't yet been tested in a systematic way in any disease. So I don't think people should be going out to the supermarket and coming home with baking soda and taking a spoonful each day. For one thing, we just, uh, we'd need more information about the safety of doing that and, and it can alter your blood acidity and it can alter the, uh, the levels of, of important ions like potassium, which could in some patients have dangerous effects. So I wouldn't recommend doing that yet. I think we need more data and we need proper clinical trials in inflammatory disease to, to, to allow us to recommend that safely. I understand. But various things, aren't they, are sold to us on the basis of their supposed anti-inflammatory qualities like, you know, olive oil and blueberries and fatty fish and whatever. Well, so I, yes, exactly. I'm assuming... Paradoxically, um, vinegar and, and cider, uh, cider vinegar and uh, honey is, a, is an old uh, and durable um, folk remedy for arthritis. So that would be expected to have the opposite effect here. OK. And I take your caveats, uh, your warnings about people having a spoonful of baking soda a day, but potentially, is it quite exciting because it would presumably have a lot more grunt in terms of what you could manufacture with this knowledge in terms of pills, yeah? Well, that's right. And, and what, the, what they've done really is just use uh, baking soda as a stimulus for, uh, for receptors in the stomach and they've discovered a, a, a novel uh, pathway of mesothelial cells which have nerve-like effects and connect the stomach to uh, the spleen. Yeah. And, uh, and so if we can stimulate that pathway uh, with, with uh, safe drugs or, or even with electrical... It could be exciting. Andrew, thank it's you. Great. Sorry we're out of time. Steve McCabe, lovely to have you on today. Thank you very much. And Cass Carter, you too. Thanks, Jim. Always a pleasure. Tonight on Checkpoint, an exclusive investigation into how the Canterbury District Health Board told the Ministers of Health and Finance things many board members didn't know they were telling them, wouldn't have said if they had known, and that the CEO didn't want said. A 17-year-old is charged with manslaughter after a security guard is struck down outside a countdown supermarket. BP executives meet the Minister of Energy, Megan Woods, after a leaked email showed the company raised petrol prices to curb losses from another Kapiti Coast station. And a woman who complained about a meth information booklet given out at an Auckland high school isn't satisfied with the explanation for why it was distributed. All that coming up.
RNZ News at 5 o'clock. Good afternoon. I'm Anna Thomas. An Auckland mother whose teenager brought home a pamphlet on meth says she can't condone a school's use of material explaining how to use the drug. Morgan Julian criticised Massey High School's use of the booklet, which includes safe ways to take illegal drugs. The school says the booklet was included as part of research material for a project investigating methamphetamine use. But Morgan Julian says it encourages teenagers to take drugs. I'm all for drug education. Children need to be made, and the youth need to be made aware that drugs are a real problem and they do have serious, serious consequences. What I don't agree with is this particular um, take out of a booklet that um, basically advocates the use of an illegal drug. Auckland mother Morgan Julian. It's been revealed that a chair of the cash-strapped Canterbury District Health Board told the government in 2015 it could manage within its existing funding. Information obtained by a checkpoint under the Official Information Act shows that in December 2015, the DHB's then chairman, Murray Cleverly, sent a letter to Jonathan Coleman and Bill English, having received an identical draft of the letter from the Ministry of Health the previous day. The DHB's CEO and the Ministry of Health were aware of the letter, but none of the board members knew. They've told Checkpoint they couldn't believe it when they learnt that what had happened and would have never agreed to the letter being sent. They say the DHB was under intense financial pressure following the Christchurch earthquakes and it desperately needed more money. Listen to the full investigation on Checkpoint coming up. A new report on a South Waikato prison says some prisoners are kept in their cells for up to 26 hours at a time. Corrections Chief Inspector Janice Adair has raised 42 points with Waikiria Prison after assessing it in July and August last year. She found at-risk prisoners were routinely kept in their cells for 22 hours a day and at times up to 26 hours. Ms Adair says one prisoner had more self-harm thoughts while locked up. Staff members were down with 21 vacant positions and one in three senior roles filled by others on secondment. The report also found the century-old high security facility, facility is not suitable for the humane treatment of prisoners. After closing in 2015, the prison had to be reopened to house the rising prison population. Correction says 30 of the issues are now solved and the others are partially resolved. Tenants living in an earthquake-prone Lower Hutt apartment building will have to find new homes after their building's owner failed to carry out urgent strengthening work over the last decade. Lower Hutt realtors Jatish and Jagishka Govant are facing a fine of up to $200,000 after being prosecuted by the Hutt City Council over their Petone property in what's believed to be the first case of its kind. Michael, his wife and two young children live in one of the building's top story flats and learned of the impending evacuation only when RNZ News visited them. That's a bit of a nightmare we've been trying to avoid and I don't really want to think about, but if we're forced to think about it, then uh, I, yeah, I really don't know where we're going to end up or, or what's going to happen or how it's going to all play out. Yeah, that's just basically our life will probably have to pretty much stop and focus everything on just trying to find suitable accommodation somewhere. Michael says he and his family have lived in the building for almost three years. BP company executives are meeting with the Energy Minister at Parliament about now. Megan Woods called the company to a meeting after a leaked internal email revealed BP raised petrol prices in towns near Otaki to compensate for losses in the Kapiti town. On her way into the meeting, the Managing Director of BP New Zealand, Debbie Boffer, rejected the comment by the Minister that the pricing behaviour in the Lower North Island was cynical. She told media that BP operated in a highly competitive environment and stands by its actions in that region. She says what the company did there was reduce discounting rather than putting up prices. 
The former New York mayor, Rudy Giuliani, says President Donald Trump reimbursed his personal attorney, Michael Cohen, the $130,000 paid to adult film star Stormy Daniels to stay quiet about their alleged affair. Mr Cohen has repeatedly said he made the payment, but that it was made with money out of his own pocket. The BBC, rather the BBC's Chris Buckler reports. Last month, when questioned by journalists on Air Force One, the president denied any knowledge of the money and said they would need to put their questions to Mr Cohen. However, in an interview on Fox News, the former New York mayor, Rudy Giuliani, who recently joined President Trump's legal team, seemed to contradict his client. In denying accusations that the payment might have broken campaign finance rules, he said Mr Trump had fully repaid Michael Cohen, a revelation that will lead to further questions. Chris Butler in Washington. It's five past five. The Hurricanes coach, Chris Boyd, has made a tough call in midfield and resisted the temptation to start Nehi Milner Scudda for Saturday night Super Rugby game against the Lions in Wellington. Boyd has made four changes to the starting side, which beat the Sunwolves 43-15 last weekend. The most notable, the return of Ngani Lomape at second five. The inclusion of the All Blacks midfielder means the inform Vince Atto moves out of the 23-man squad. All Blacks wing Milner Scudder remains in a substitutes role after making his return from a prolonged injury layoff off the bench against the Sunwolves. The new owners of the Warriors say they want to strengthen the pathway between the grassroots and the club now that they have control of the NRL franchise. Car Law Heritage Trust took over the majority stake yesterday. Trust and Auckland Rugby League chairperson Cameron McGregor says they want kids in Auckland and around the country to grow up wanting to play for the Warriors. We see this as an opportunity long term to re-establish the pathways in the game so that our under sixes that are playing out there at the moment have a, have a vision to be able to play right through to the, uh, you know, to the professional sport in the NRL. So that to us is the long term vision. Cameron McGregor and that's the news. Minds. I dearly like to be one of those people who go back in. I've always said that I would never ask anybody to do anything I wouldn't do myself. And it's a pledge I would like to honour some families. Math. I was just getting it given to me, so it was it was sort of simple to get. And it still was to me. It's true, you know, mess is everywhere. Money. In terms of spending state money to put a lot of sunlight on this, I think that's a very, very good use of it because we're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars here. Morning Report with Guy and Espiner and Susie Ferguson, weekdays from six. Then on 9 to noon, more than $200 million has been spent on pokies in the first quarter of this year alone. But with fewer machines, what is driving the growing trend? And after 10, hunting El Chapo, the gripping behind-the-scenes story of the manhunt for America's most wanted drug lord. Join me, Catherine Ryan, on 9 to noon after morning report on RNZ National. And now the short forecast from Met Service to midnight tomorrow. Gisborne and Hawke's Bay, cloudy periods, isolated light showers north of Wairoa and the remainder of the North Island mainly fine, some high cloud tomorrow. For all of the South Island, excluding Fiordland, fine apart from areas of cloud. And for Fiordland, mostly cloudy with isolated showers. And for the Chatham Islands, cloudy periods and the odd light shower. RNZ National, it's 8 past 5 and you're listening to Checkpoint with John Campbell. Thank you very much indeed, Anna Thomas. And thank you everyone for being with us. We begin tonight with the checkpoint investigation into the way the Ministry of Health has been working with the country's district health boards. We do this off the back of our extensive work on health board deficits and our interviews revealing tension between the Ministry and senior figures in some DHBs. And we do this off the back of all the questions over the past few weeks about how the public health system contains so many surprises, rotting and leaking buildings, budget, budget blowouts, massive shortfalls in capital funding and issues with screening programs. How were the messages getting through, not getting through or getting lost in translation? Well, we can't answer that question tonight. There will be so many reasons why. But after months of investigations tonight, we can exclusively reveal one surprise. How the ministers of health and finance were told the Canterbury District Health Board would manage capital spending within existing funding and resources when the CEO and almost everyone on the board thought they couldn't. We begin with an email. If you're watching, you can see it. If you're listening, it's dated the 10th of December 2015, and it was sent at 17 a.m. The sender is Michael Hundleby from the Ministry of Health. The recipient is redacted, 
the checkpoint can reveal it was sent to the personal email address of the chairman of the Canterbury District Health Board, Murray Cleverly. It reads, Murray, draft letter below we were going to discuss today, cheers. And then we have the draft letter itself. It's written to Jonathan Coleman, Health Minister and Bill English, Finance Minister. And the name at the bottom of the letter is that of the man whose personal email account it's been sent to, Murray Cleverly. It's a draft letter, yes, but the next day, December 11th, and we have this too, it reappears on Canterbury DHB letterhead signed by Murray Cleverly this time, the chair it had been emailed to, and sent on to Ministers English and Coleman. And what did Mr Cleverly change in the letter he'd been emailed from the Ministry of Health? Well, we've put them side by side and highlighted the words that have remained the same. They are identical. CDHB has become Canterbury DHB, yours sincerely has become kind regards, and every other word has remained the same. And here's why this letter, sent to Murray Cleverley's personal email account, then sent on by Mr Cleverley to two ministers, is so important. One, in post-earthquake Christchurch, it was committing the Canterbury DHB to managing capital spending within existing Crown funding and the DHB's own resources. And two, no one on the board knew Murray Cleverly was sending it. Because the letter was dated December the 10th and it wasn't until the following February, I think, that uh, we found out about it, myself and other board members. Anna Crichton, Canterbury District Health Board member. So the board did not know that their chair had sent this to the Ministers of Health and Finance? No. And yet in it, their chair is effectively saying, we don't need any more money. Yes, exactly right. And that's, we, we, um, we, we did, couldn't believe that he could do that. But he did. That's Anna Crichton, and I also spoke to another board member, Joe Kane. Joe, when did you first see this letter that uh, the former chairman, Murray Cleverly, sent to the ministers in December 2015, dated 11th of December 2015? Yes, that was about four, five, maybe six months after it had been sent. That's when you first saw it? Yep. When board members first saw the letter is inexact now, and the time frame varies. But of the board members I've spoken to on and off the record, none saw it before it was sent, and none knew it was being sent. And what was your reaction when you found out this had happened? <laughs> My reaction? I, I, was, I was pretty pissed off. In preparing the story, the board members I was able to speak to have all told me that, although some in less colourful terms. And what they've also all said is that they don't know where the letter came from. Murray cleverly sent it under his name on DHB letterhead, but it didn't reflect their position. I don't know who wrote that letter, but I do know that after further inquiries, I did find out that the letter did not come from the Canterbury District Health Board uh, secretarial team. Anna Crichton. Joe Kane. Who wrote the letter? <laughs> Pretty obvious who wrote the letter. So who wrote it? A letter sent from the Ministry on December 10th to a personal email address sent back to Wellington the following day, this time on CDHB letterhead and to Bill English and Jonathan Coleman. Murray cleverly politely declined to talk to me, but he did talk to our producer, Bridget Burke, and he told her... Oh, well, basically, I work pretty closely with the ministry as well, and so when you're discussing different things, and I haven't, you notice I haven't confirmed or denied once anyone who wrote that letter, you know, um, but I certainly put my signature to it. And it's the signature that makes that letter to the ministers so important. In actual fact, is I think it's irrelevant who wrote it. It's actually what's important is who signed it. And so at the end of the day, I put my name to it, so I have to take some ownership for that letter. So Bill English and Jonathan Coleman had a letter signed by the chair of the DHB on DHB letterhead about managing capital demands that the rest of the board didn't know about. Clearly shows it was a cut in the pace. 
that it was a direction. Um, and that's what our chair wrote, sadly, for the CDHB. And it sadly has been the crux of our whole relationship issues with the MOH, who work kind of in a different way than I think that a ministry should work between their ministries and the shareholders. When you found out this letter from the chairman of the board to the two most important ministers in the life of a district health board had been sent without the board being consulted, what was your reaction? Well, we we we, we just couldn't believe that anybody could, could do that. We just couldn't believe it. Was it correct, the letter? Were you able to do the capital expenditure required from within existing... No, no. We, we, we'd, been, we'd been fighting for more money. We were, in, we were in exceptional circumstances after the earthquake. Exceptional circumstances. And at no way would we have been able to work within our means on the budget that we had, and especially the capital budget. That's Anna Crichton following Joe Kane. Both women elected members of the board rather than appointed, and therefore they both told me able to speak out without worrying what the ministry thinks of them. They were the only board members prepared to go on the record, but nowhere near the only people I spoke to. All have told the same story. But Murray cleverly said he had a choice, take the board with them or do a deal with Wellington. The former chairman seems to feel they weren't both possible in December 2015. Absolutely. That's the most uncomfortable thing is when you don't take a board with you on a whole journey. Um, but sometimes under urgency and under importance, um, it's important to actually put you... That's why you are the chair. You need to make some decisions sometime for the best for the organisation, in your opinion. So the end justifies the means, the former chair says. We were trying to get the outpatient's approval over the line. Um, to build the outpatients building at a cost of, you know, about 90 million or 70 to 90 million. And uh, we were, we, I was trying to get the support from, I had to get the support from the Minister of Health and the Minister of Finance to get that across the line. There was nothing um, untoward in it. There was nothing um, exceptionally <laughs> exciting about it, except it was just um, trying to play with a, trying to arrange the outcomes that are suitable for um, Canterbury. And, and basically, I have to, give a bit of assurance to the ministers that I wasn't going to be back the next day with another request for another $100 million. even though we knew we were actually well under uh, short on getting all the work that needs to be done there, which they're discovering, which we knew anyway we were about $250 million shy. But whatever his motives, the chairman wrote to the ministers without his board knowing, committing to an end in terms of managing within existing funding that many of his senior colleagues didn't think was supportable. I still take the right of the chair um, to be able to step, if I need to assert my, um, over assert my authority or whatever it takes to get a job done. Look, we can stand by um, process and protocols all we like, but at the end of the day, we've got a huge, we've got a big job to do. And uh, it was important to get it done. The board didn't know, but at 1.40 p.m. on the 10th of December, Murray cleverly forwarded the draft letter to the DHB CEO, David Mates. Mr Mates appears to think it's fully Murray Cleverly's own work, although we can't confirm that, and replies in an email that's explicitly incredulous. It's unclear, he wrote, what the letter is responding to. Has a letter been received from the ministers, or has this been requested from the Ministry of Health? And then David Mates lists all the reasons the letter shouldn't be sent. Generic ones, I quote, the DHB is not in control of decisions. Financial ones, increased financial risk. And then explicitly the CEO writes, it is really difficult for ministers to understand the size of the facility damage we are grappling with. 44 buildings demolished or soon to be demolished. And David Mates also writes, there is approximately a total of an additional $200 million that will be required. So David Mates did not mince his words or his assessment of their financial requirements. But the next day, with no changes, the chairman of the board sent the letter anyway. You know, living within our means is one of our core, um, core objectives. But that's as long as you're funded correctly. 
and we were not being funded correctly. It's that simple. So the board didn't know, the CEO said don't do it and explained why very explicitly in writing and yet Murray cleverly did it anyway. He took the letter that had been sent to his personal email address the previous day, it was put on CDHB letterhead, Murray cleverly signed it and sent it to Minister English and Minister Coleman. And clearly Murray cleverly feels it was the right thing for him to have done. But why? Did he feel coerced in any way? Our producer Bridget Burke asked him. I think I always felt coerced. No, no, I don't, I don't think coerced. I, I, coerced. I think the um, word was I always felt squeezed. I always felt like the meat and sandwich. The ministry as one slice, the DHB as the other, in this case the chairman alone jammed in the middle. We wanted an overview on this, so we went to a man who's worked for many years with senior staff in all 20 DHBs, Ian Powell. And we asked him about Ministry of Health Relations with DHBs under the leadership of former ministry boss Chai Chua, who resigned last December. It was a poor relationship. I think many district health boards believe that they were being cajoled, they were being bullied, they were being harassed, uh, they were being pressured. And the head of the Association of Salaried Medical Specialists said the most pressure was applied when DHBs were speaking out, particularly around funding inadequacies, which was the issue facing Canterbury. It took a brave person to actually put your hand up and make a bit of a noise about that. The more noise you made, the worse it was for your prospects, Catch-22, because boards are meant to be advocates for the communities they represent. They have to speak out on behalf of the needs of the population they are serving. And I think the experience has been over the last nine years at least uh, that that was increasingly more and more difficult. Ian Powell is not alone in telling us this. Checkpoint has reported on this at length over the past few months. We even asked the former minister about it in an interview with Jonathan Coleman last year. I've been told the ministry is very difficult to deal with and also running scared. Are they stuck between a rock and the hard place? Are they having to pass on bad news to DHBs and protect you from the repercussions? No, I wouldn't see it like that. Jonathan Coleman, last year, we have made repeated attempts to contact him this week. He hasn't responded. But back in Canterbury, Murray Cleverley is strong in his personal belief that if he hadn't signed and sent that letter, there would have been consequences. And I suppose that's all um, uh, subjective. The fact is that I believe if I didn't submit that letter, um, we wouldn't have had a outpatient here today. We can't say whether that's true, but Murray cleverly believes it is. And that belief led him to sign a letter he's not able to tell us he wrote without board knowledge against the express and explicit wishes of his CEO, making commitments he felt he had no choice but to make. A DHB after major earthquakes, so much work to be done, not enough money to do it all. And I don't think we would have got the outpatients over the line if I didn't do that, you know. And Murray cleverly doesn't think there was anything unusual about his transaction with Michael Hundleby. Uh, you could speak to a number of chairs around the country. Um, his role as special projects or whatever that means. Um, and he was the man that had those conversations with a number of um, uh, DHB chairs on a number of times, you know. It's symptomatic of how that ministry was working. Joe Kane, other board members I spoke to, people inside the DHB, the CEO in writing in that email we referred to earlier, still don't know why their former chair sent an important and controversial letter of understanding without their agreement to the Ministers of Health and Finance that was identical to the draft he'd been sent from the Health Ministry the previous day. It's a cut and paste, quite simply, John, it's a cut and paste exercise. Crude rude, just, you know, just, just lacking in any sort of integrity, lacking in any sort of real professional nous. Um, and just, you know, highlights to me just how difficult it's been for people in health. Winners and losers, it should never work like that. 
Joe Kane, who is an elected board member on the CDHB. Now, Michael Hundleby, the Director of Critical Projects, is his title now at the Ministry of Health, refused to be interviewed by Checkpoint for this investigation. But a short time ago, we received a statement from the Director General of Health, Stephen McKernan. Instead, he says, I understand that the emails you quote regard a period in 2015 when Canterbury DHB required approval from the Minister of Finance to build the Outpatients Building. As is usual, the Finance Minister had expectations of the DHB as a prerequisite for approval of the capital investment. After discussion with the Canterbury DHB Chair, Ministry of Health officials agreed to draft a letter for the DHB covering these expectations for their consideration. Mr McKernan says he appreciates the pressure experienced by many DHB chairs and is mindful of that in its dealings with them. He says the Ministry often acts as the Minister's agent in its communications with the health sector. You're with Checkpoint, it's 25 and a half past five. A 17-year-old has been charged with manslaughter following the death of a security guard at Countdown in Auckland. The guard was assaulted yesterday at the supermarket in Papakura and died this morning. In a statement, Countdown's managing director Dave Chambers says the safety of staff and customers is their absolute priority and no New Zealander should go to work and not expect to return home to their loved ones. The guard had been working at the supermarket for eight months. Shocked workers and customers said he was a lovely man who enjoyed a joke. He was like such a gentleman and he'd always be like willing to like talk to us and he'd like ask us how we were, he'd like ask what we've been up to and he'd also share about himself. Yeah, he was just like a really nice person. Yeah, really innocent. He was the loveliest of men. He um, was always chatty and friendly and always made a laugh and always cracked a joke. Shock and sadness. I just can't imagine coming down here and not seeing, his, seeing him again. When I heard it, yeah. I couldn't believe it. And um, I'm fighting back now. I'm choked up. But he was a magnificent person. He really was. He loved to talk. He loved to have a joke. He loved to have her on. <laughs> Cowardly, reprehensible, but most of all, a tragic waste of human life. That's how police are describing the killing of the security guard. They won't comment further, and as charges have been laid, it's not appropriate for them to do so. But on the broader issues of such attacks, they're now labelling them coward punches. And a short time ago, Inspector Dave Glossop, the area commander for County's Monaco Police, told me they're becoming more frequent. My first ever um, arrest for a homicide, uh, I don't even want to count the years ago, um, you know, was just simply somebody overhearing somebody saying something derogatory uh, outside of takeaway. And, um, you know, the person wasn't even facing towards this guy who went over and just punched this guy from behind. And exactly, uh, you know, as other circumstances have been, this guy went down, smacked his head on the concrete and, uh, and died there and then uh, from that punch. You know, it's just such a waste of human life. And uh, in those circumstances, that person was an absolute coward, you know, to punch somebody and risk their life. Uh, when the when the person's not even paying attention, um, and say you know, it's never justifiable, but in those cowardly circumstances, it's reprehensible. In, Inspector, you refer to it as an act of cowardice. What is it that you are calling these punches? Well, um, they were traditionally referred to as um, sucker punches, but um, we quite like the term um, uh, coward's punch because it does reflect what actually goes on. It is the you know, a punch made without warning uh, while, the while the recipient is distracted and at no time or uh, is able to prepare himself and defend himself. So what is traditionally happening is with these coward's punches is that uh, a person is often rendered unconscious or incapable of protecting themselves as they fall. And it is just a consequence of that. You know, um, what is traditionally happening is these things are happening everywhere, outside licensed premises, you know, outside a takeaway uh, on this, uh, you know, can happen anywhere. And the person falls to the ground and sadly often hits their head on a hard surface like concrete or a curb. And I think people just forget the damage that that can cause, you know. But falling from a standing height without able to protect yourself can cause what is, can happen be a fatal um, injury. And um, it's, yeah, uh, I mean, we, we, we condemn all violence, but uh, really want to condemn, you know, what is a coward's punch. It's just, um, there's no place for it in our society. And I think it's really worth stressing how much damage a single punch can do. 
Yeah, look, it's it's that double. Um, it's the perfect storm, isn't it? It's the fact that the punch, uh, an unexpected, undefended punch, uh, does a lot of damage in and of itself. But then, when if that punch incapacitates or renders somebody uh, you know, unconscious and they fall to the ground, the secondary damage that is caused. Um, you know, I don't know whether it's because of movies or just you know people forget how delicate the human body is, and it can have tragic consequences. Yes, uh, you know, I've got a teenage son and I've watched infinite fight scenes in which people have been hit multiple times and they just get up. But then, you know, you and I watched the Westerns when we were kids, right? The same happened to John Wayne. So I'm not sure any of that is new, but I do wonder if we are seeing more of these coward punches. Yeah, look, it, it, it's just really, really concerning that there does seem to be a lot of uh, focus on them, uh, whether there's actually an increase or we're really starting to understand the damage that they cause. Um, you know, however it's come about, um, you know, there just needs to be that awareness. Um, you know, there's nothing macho in punching somebody who is not able to protect themselves. Uh, you know, it is a coward's punch and the result can be tragic. And there is no mitigation in law, or at least that's door is closing in terms of somebody mounting the defence, I just threw one punch. Well, look, um, I, I have to be careful about commenting on the law, but, you know, the, the a case for self-defence when somebody is not able to protect themselves and is not posing a threat to you, you know, to say it's often the coward's punch is when the recipient, the recipient is distracted, um, you know, in and of itself makes it very difficult to defend. But, you know, uh, violence is unacceptable, full stop, but uh, a coward's punch is just, you know, it's, it needs to be condemned. That is Inspector Dave Glossop, who's the Area Commander for Counties Monaco Police. <laughs>Uh, with Checkpoint on RNZ, thank you for being with us. Coming up, the latest from Energy Minister Megan Woods meeting with BP executives as we speak, I think. Thousands of midwives march across the country to demand better pay and working conditions. A Wellington landlord is convicted for failing to carry out urgent strengthening work. Havelock North residents living near a smelly mushroom farm say they've been let down by both the district and regional councils. Where's Nona, someone asked last night. Well, she's right beside me. But before any of it, here is Anna Thomas with the RNZ headlines. Thanks, John. The managing director of BP New Zealand, Debbie Boffer, is rejecting a comment by the energy minister that the company's pricing behaviour in the lower north Island is cynical. Megan Woods called the company to a meeting after a leaked internal email revealed BP raised petrol prices in towns near Otaki to compensate for losses in the Kapiti town. On her way into the meeting tonight, Ms Boffa told media BP operates in a highly competitive environment and stands by its actions in that region. A new report on Waikiria Prison has found staff numbers were down with 21 vacant positions and one in three senior roles filled by others on secondment. Corrections Chief Inspector Janice Adair has raised 42 points with the prison after assessing it in July and August last year. Her report found some prisoners are kept in their cells for up to 26 hours at a time and the facility is not suitable for the humane treatment of prisoners. An Auckland mother says giving students pamphlets about meth only encourages the teenagers to take the drug. Massey High School says the booklet was included as part of research material for a project investigating methamphetamine use. But Morgan Julian criticised use of the booklet, which includes safe ways to take meth, saying the pamphlet basically advocates the use of an illegal drug. Tenants living in an earthquake-prone Lower Hutt building are forced to look for other accommodation after their landlords were prosecuted for failing to carry out urgent strengthening work in the past decade. In what's believed to be the first case of its kind, Lower Hutt realtors Jatish and Jagisha Govind are facing a fine of up to $200,000. One tenant found out about the need to move only after RNZ News visited him. And the former New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani says President Donald Trump reimbursed his personal attorney Michael Cohen the $130,000 paid to adult film star Stormy Daniels to stay quiet about their reported affair. And that's the news. Thank you very much indeed. Anna Thomas, see you in about 26 minutes. Uh, Nona.
Peltier on the other side of me. Hi, Nina with Business News tonight. The Bank of New Zealand, Australian owned, of course. Yes, by... one of the big four. NAB. Thank you. Has made a strong profit as customer uh, deposits and savings increase. Indeed, they did. Yes. Nice dividend for NAB. Uh, well, and other shareholders. I mean, don't, let's not forget that it's shareholders who own these banks, right? Yeah. They're not privately owned. No. No. Okay. So, yes. Well, they made a very good profit, up 18% to $490 million in the first half. So that's a, that's a hefty. That's a half year profit. That's a half year profit. That's a lot of money. And in fact, uh, their revenue was up 11%, $1.2 billion. And that was boosted by growth in uh, business and home lending. And uh, their margins have improved. Their customer deposits are up. It's a pretty good result all up. Absolutely lovely for them. And their expenses were also up, but they said that was okay because they're investing in digital. They're saying that more than 90% of their transactions now are digital. Wow. Yeah. It's quite a lot, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's a hell and they, they're going to keep so investing. I was thinking about that. I'm, yes. yeah. yeah, in fact, 92% is what they said. So which means 8% of branches. Old school queuing up. Yes, yeah. that's right. Me yeah, yeah, meeting people. Yeah, well, yeah. I was at the bank today. Were well, you know? Yeah, I'm one yeah. of those people who like to say hello. It was a beautiful day to go for a walk. <laughs> yes, that's right. Uh, what did the BNZ say about the Australian Royal Commission into banking? Well, uh, we spoke with the ANZ earlier this week, and this time we spoke with the Bank of New Zealand, and they basically said the same thing. Their books are, their hands are clean. They have not done anything that uh, they should be embarrassed about, and they are happy for the inquiries that are being made here. Uh, they they work under a different uh, regulatory. Uh, framework with the Financial Markets Authority and the Reserve Bank of New Zealand is a different game than what happens in Australia. Also, the work that they do here is different. You know, it's interesting. Somebody asked me yesterday about this, but a lot of investment in New Zealand is passive investment. But the Australians, a lot of them like to do active investment, and that requires financial advice. And so they tend to seek it more often than we would. Right. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Yeah. Uh, ZD Energy released its full year result today. It won't have been as big as the BNZ half year, will it? No, but it wasn't. It was still pretty healthy. Yeah, their profit was okay. It was what did they call it? A modest lift. Modest lift. But never mind. For the year end in March, they made two hundred and sixty-three million. That was twenty million more than they made the year before. Right. So it's quite a good. That's still a good profit. And, and we kind of know the regions they're making it in, thanks to the news coverage of the past week or two. Don't well, we? no. That wait a minute. Now, just before you get into that, uh, in fact, a lot of the profit growth that they've got is they're reaping and starting to ba bank the profits they got from the uh, purchase of the Caltex brand right. a couple of years ago. So that's a lot of reason why they have a bit of a, a very strong position. And, and they say, just like the banks, go ahead, come and look at our books. We have nothing to hide. So that's the response to the fuel pricing revelation. Yeah, that's right. Okay. okay. <laughs> so there you go. That answers that, right? Excellent. I'm ahead of you, John. Yeah, thanks, Nada. Well, <laughs> what, what happened on the markets today? Okay, well, uh, on the markets, we had our top 50 index. It rose two-thirds of a percent, 53 points up to 8,547, which is pretty good because uh, the trade talks uh, that between China and the United States, there's a lot of tension there, there's a bit of worry. Our New Zealand dollar, it fell a little bit overnight, but it kind of came back up a little this today, so it's been holding steady, and that's partly because the U.S. Federal Reserve indicated that they're going to raise rates uh, as they expected over the rest of the year, So, they, even though they held them steady on Wednesday. So we are at 70.1 U.S. cents, 93.2 Australian, and 51.6 pence. Nona Peltier, thank you very much indeed. It's uh, 22 minutes to six. Thousands of midwives have marched across the country today to demand better pay and working conditions. Ten events were held from Auckland down to Otago. Hundreds of those midwives presented a 13,000 signature petition and hundreds of letters to the Health Minister David Clark on the steps of Parliament. Reporter Charlie Drever and cameraman John Lake were with the midwives in Wellington and they filed this report. There were costumes, cake, balloons and even dancing at today's march on a sunny Wellington day. Some might think it was a birthday party, but the hundreds of protesters, which included midwives, students, mothers, tamariki and Fano, had a much more serious message. Happy midwives! Happy mothers! Happy Fano! Happy mothers! Charlie Ferris organised a campaign called Dear David, where hundreds of midwives wrote letters to Minister David Clark calling for change. She says the working conditions and pay are tough. The average hourly wage at the moment for a rural midwife like myself is $7.23 an hour after business expenses. And for a midwife in a city like Wellington, um, it's about $12.40. The workload is easily 40 hours a week. Um, 40 hours would be cruisy for most midwives, I would say. I myself have done up to 80 hours a week um, in the last year. 
and it's not as infrequent as I would like it to be. It happens a lot more often than it should. Each and every midwife we spoke to had their own story to tell. Sarah Glass says she's on call 24 hours a day and her work always comes first. When you're a midwife in the community, you, your first priority is your clients, your second priority is your children, your third priority might be your partner and your family, and somewhere down the bottom of the heap you come just above the cat. <laughs> her dedication to the job was apparent when she had to give an emergency tracheostomy to her choking husband. The first phone call we made was to the ambulance. The second phone call we made was trying to find someone to cover all my clients at 9 o'clock on a Friday night. The New Zealand College of Midwives Chief Executive Karen Gilliland was there at today's event and says the conditions midwives are working in are taking its toll. I've been in, um, around midwifery for about 40 years and I've never seen such a level of hopelessness. I think it's because we've been saying these things for a long time and nobody takes any notice. After congregating and practising their chanting in Civic Square, a wave of purple flooded the streets of Wellington to make themselves heard. Armed with megaphones, ferry wings, banners and their voices, they brightened up the grey pavement of Lampton Quay. They even took inspiration from the Spice Girls to spread their message of girl power. How many hours roughly can you work a week? Oh, that's so hard to calculate. Sometimes I'm doing 12 hours with a woman, I have no break. Sometimes I go down to go to the toilet, have them to eat, come straight back to the room, there is no break. Sometimes that, that a truck driver has to have a break. Our women are worth better than this and we are worth better than this. As the purple rained onto the lawn outside Parliament, they were met with the Minister of Health, David Clark, and the Minister for Women, Julianne Genta. Holding her baby bump, Minister Julianne Genta described her own experience with her midwife. Now, I knew there was a shortage of midwives, so I, didn't, I hadn't even tried to find an LMC. But she called me back later that day with an LMC who is totally willing and very passionate about natural birthing and home births. And I'm working with her now, and I just feel so lucky to look after her. Minister David Clark promised the government are paying attention. Um, your messages have been coming through to me loud and clear. Uh, I don't know when I last had so much personal correspondence. <laughs> However, when asked if midwives will get a fair pay for their work in this year's budget, he was keeping mum. Do they deserve more than $7 in rural areas and $12 in the main centres? Well, I, I haven't seen those figures, but I think everyone will accept that midwife pay has not kept up over the last nine years, particularly uh, the lead maternity carers. Uh, their pay rates have not kept pace with those in DHBs. We have an issue of underfunding in the health sector and we need to make sure that this workforce is properly and adequately supported. So just how much support midwives will get will be revealed on Budget Day on May 17. For Checkpoint, I'm Charlie Drever. People living in a quake-prone Lower Hutt apartment building will have to find new homes following their landlord's conviction for failing to carry out urgent strengthening work. Lower Hutt Realt Realtors Jitish and Jagisha Govind are facing a fine of up to $200,000 after being prosecuted by Hutt City Council over their Patoni property in what's believed to be the first case of its kind. Katie Scotcher reports on this. Michael, his wife and two young children live in one of the building's top story flats. They've lived there for almost three years and have decorated the place with family photos, mirrors and an eclectic collection of pot plants outside their front door. Michael only learned of the impending evacuation when visited by RNZ News. That's a bit of a nightmare we've been trying to avoid and, and don't really want to think about, but if we're forced to think about it, then uh, I, yeah, I really don't know where we're going to end up or, or what's going to happen or how it's going to all play out. Yeah, that's just basically our life will probably have to pretty much stop and focus everything on just trying to find suitable accommodation somewhere. Michael says the owners have not kept them informed of progress. I haven't spoken to them about it and they haven't, they haven't mentioned it to us. I knew that, that there was certain time, time frames for work to be done and I knew it hadn't been done, but I, I didn't know what was, what was happening or, or if anything was going to happen about it. I knew this day was coming, but, but I was, uh, yeah, like I say, trying not to think about it and hoping it wouldn't come. 
Six of the eight apartments are currently occupied. Jitesh and Jagesha Govind were to be meeting with tenants at five o'clock this evening. A spokeswoman for Hutt City Council, Helen Oram, says the prosecution follows a decade of repeated attempts by the council to get the owners to strengthen the building to a safe standard. With more recent events like the Kaikoura earthquake and legislative changes and more information coming out of organisations like GNS Science, who we work closely with, they've added more urgency to getting this building safe. And pretty much we're saying that council's not tolerant of people who, or companies that don't take reasonable progress to strengthen their buildings. Miss Oram says this isn't the only building being investigated by the council. There aren't any more um, residentially occupied buildings in the hut in this situation, but there certainly are commercial buildings, and certainly after this, the success of this case, we are definitely looking to taking action um, against owners who are planning to drag their feet on strengthening work, and I, I believe they should take notice of this. She says tenants will have to evacuate the building, but an exact date is yet to be determined. Court documents obtained by RNZ show the building, which is in Petoni's Jackson Street Heritage Precinct, was identified as an earthquake risk by the Hutt City Council in 1984. The then owners of the building were advised that it required strengthening or demolishing by 2004. Three years later, the Govins purchased it. Neither Jitesh or Jagesha Govind would be interviewed, but in a statement said... We continue to work with our architect and engineers to find a practical solution to strengthening the building while also preserving the heritage facade. We fully intend that the building will comply with council standards. We have always kept our tenants informed of the status of the building. Jitesh and Jagisha Govind will be sentenced in the Hutt Valley District Court in early August. For Checkpoint, call Katie Scotch at 10 14 minutes to 6. A woman who complained about a methamphetamine information booklet given to her daughter at an Auckland high school still isn't satisfied with the explanation for why it was distributed to children. Some senior students at Massey High School in West Auckland were given a booklet with methamphetamine safety notes as part of a project. The school says the booklet was included as part of research material for a project investigating methamphetamine use in New Zealand. A big story at the moment. And principals say resources like this are important for preparing teenagers for life outside of school. Our reporter Sarah Robson has more. Morgan Julian was shocked when her 17-year-old daughter, a student at Massey High School, brought home the pamphlet which included a 10-point guide on ways for meth users to keep well. That, she says, encourages teenagers to take drugs. I'm all for drug education. Children need to be made, and the youth need to be made aware that drugs are a real problem and they do have serious, serious consequences. What I don't agree with is this particular um, take out of a booklet that um, basically advocates the use of an illegal drug. Morgan Julian says meth is addictive and it can destroy families. When you've watched somebody lose their entirety of their existence, their family, their home, themselves to something like meth, um, and you know exactly how destructive and disgusting it is as a drug, having that simple step-by-step -step guide been made available to children, whether they're smart or not, is irrelevant. Drugs are drugs. The president of the Secondary Principals Association, Mike Williams, says students need to be trusted to use controversial learning material appropriately. He says while parents can't be blamed for being concerned, resources like this prepare students for life after school. There's a real probability when their children are out in the big wide world the following year that they're going to come up with someone who is using or that is available and that students need to be able to deal with that. And more than that, we want our young people to be going out in society and become the leaders out there and be informed and make stands, moral stands against some of these things. And they can't do that from a place of ignorance. The Education Minister, Chris Hipkins, agrees, saying it's important schools discuss issues around drugs. It's a little bit like sex education, you know, the fact that schools are talking about it and teaching kids about it doesn't mean that they're encouraging kids to do it. Chris Hipkins says while he's a bit weary about the material used by Massey High School, it's ultimately up to individual schools to decide what they teach students. For me, the material being discussed perhaps goes a little bit too far, um, but you know, ultimately that's a judgement for the school to make in consultation with their parent community. It's really important that the school talks to their parent community about what they're teaching kids. The Health Education Association represents health teachers in high schools. Its co-chair, Rachel Dixon, says the association doesn't endorse the material in its entirety, 
but she says elements of it are relevant to the Year 13 school project. I am absolutely sure that the learning would have been wrapped around a safe and supportive learning environment. The kids would have known the context for the learning. The subject or the topic of methamphetamine is not intended to glorify drug use whatsoever. Massey High School's principal didn't want to comment any further about the issue. Morgan Julian has now taken down her Facebook post about the pamphlet, but her feelings about its content haven't changed. Mō te hōtaka o te ahi ahi, ko Sarah Robson, aho. Just before 10 to 6. The British government could have to pay millions in compensation after a computer error meant hundreds of thousands of women missed out on breast screening. Up to 270 women may have died prematurely from breast cancer as a result. Health Secretary Jeremy Hunt has told Parliament that 450,000 women missed out on breast screenings after a computer algorithm failure stopped letters from being sent, reminding them to have a check up this report from the ABC. The true human cost of this IT stuff up has yet to emerge. There's those who may have died and the grief it caused their loved ones and there's those who may have avoided gruelling treatment. Under the UK health system, Patricia Minchin was due a mammogram five years ago, after she turned 70, but the notification never arrived. Two years later, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. I look back now and think, you know, everything that happened since could possibly have been avoided or lessened. The whole journey I went on, the traumatic journey of the whole, all the treatment, could may never have had to be happen. It was a sombre health secretary who walked to the dispatch box in the House of Commons to deliver the extraordinary news that a computer glitch could have led to the deaths of hundreds of women. Between 2009 and the start of 2018, an estimated 450,000 women aged between 68 and 71 were not invited to their final breast screening. Our current best estimate which comes with caveats as it's based on statistical modelling rather than patient reviews, and because there is currently no clinical consensus about the benefits of screening for this age group, is that there may be between 135 and 270 women who had their lives shortened as a result. This debacle continued undetected for eight years. Public Health England, who oversaw the program, only discovered the problem after it began analysing data from the screenings. The National Health Service could face a massive compensation bill. Baroness Morgan, the Chief Executive of Breast Cancer Now, says the failure to notify so many women about their screenings is unacceptable. I feel extremely sad for the women affected by this colossal administrative disaster really. Uh, it's hugely significant. You know, we have to be concerned about, you know, generally about confidence in the screening service now, but we need to know how has this happened. An independent review has been launched and the Minister has apologised for the failures in the system. It's thought that women in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland were not affected. That report from Steve Cannon of the uh, ABC. Let's go to Havelock North now in Hawke's Bay, of course, where residents living near a smelly mushroom farm say they've been let down by both the district and regional councils, which have allowed the farm to get away with breaching its resource consent. But the owner of the Temata Mushroom Company says he's also a victim, blaming the councils for tying him up in what he says is frustratingly slow, both consent and court processes. Here's our Hawke's Bay reporter, Anusha Bradley. Kevin and Margaret Williams live 250 metres from Temata Mushrooms and have done so for the last 10 years. There's not a whiff of the notorious smell when I visit, but they give me a vivid description. Smells like cow poos, stinking strong, compost smell, sulphur stink, really strong, putrid, and once it comes into the house you can't get rid of it. And how does it make you feel? Physically sick, yes. Sometimes you'll wake up at night and you'll think, oh, you'd be safe to have your windows open in the summer, and you, oh, you wake up and it's putrid. The couple say it's only been in the last five years when the new owner took over that the stink has become more frequent and worse. The owner of Tomato Mushrooms, Michael Whitaker, says he's puzzled by the claims. Production on this farm hasn't changed for over a decade. We still use exactly the same recipe that's been used here for 20 years. 
we we now don't produce compost outside on a Wednesday, so if anything, the odour should have reduced by 20%. The only thing that we can think of is that houses have got closer. The Chief Executive of Hastings District Council, Ross McLeod, says the subdivision near the farm has never been a problem until now. He says the onus is on the Hawke's Bay Regional Council to prosecute if the odour breaches the farm's consent. In 2016, the farm was prosecuted and fined $15,000 because of the smell. The company was required to apply for a new resource consent, which it did, but another consent from the district council to expand its operations has been in limbo ever since. Mr Whitaker says it's taking time to find the experts he needs. The regional council's had 800 complaints about the farm since 2013, including 180 since December the 1st, from a core group of about 25 complainants. But after issuing $1,000 fines almost daily over summer, the regional council's regulation manager Liz Lambert says it won't anymore because it's a waste of time. Nearby resident Michael Fowler is not happy with that decision. No, no I'm not. I just believe that there was certain rules put around the mushroom farm and as my understanding is that they haven't been uh, adhered to and the regional council needs to get its act together in my opinion and sort it out. But Liz Lambert is hoping another prosecution laid against the company a few weeks ago will spur it into action. There are solutions to the odour issue and they've known about those for a while and have you know, been said that they're committed to addressing them but uh, in our view, they haven't perhaps addressed them in a timely manner. Michael Whitaker says, like his neighbours, he feels let down by both councils as he's being tied up in legal action and can't invest in odour controls. It's an investment of over two and a half million dollars. So what we've said all, the, all along, going back to December 2015, is that unless this farm can expand, it can't afford to invest that sort of capital. Uh, and that's, again, that's a frustrating situation we find ourselves in. Tomato mushrooms will appear in the Environment Court next Thursday. If found guilty of the charges, it could face a fine of up to $600,000. In Napier for Checkpoint, Anusha Bradley. Australian academic David Goodall has bid Australia farewell to fly across the world to end his life. He's a lauded academic and botanist. He's not ill but 104 years old and he says he's now losing his independence. He's just over it really and will end his life voluntarily at a clinic in Switzerland. He says whatever life stood for isn't the case any longer. Colette Luke from Reuters has filed this report. When Australian academic David Goodall turned 104 years old last month, he had one wish to end his life. I greatly regret having reached that age. His wish may well come true this week. Goodall is flying to Switzerland to an end-of-life clinic to die through voluntary euthanasia. And if one chooses uh, to kill oneself, then that should be fair enough. And I don't think anyone else should in interfere. Goodall, who is from Perth, is an honorary research associate at Edith Cowan University. He played tennis until he was 90 years old and performed in a theater group. But as his physical condition has deteriorated, he's been unable to keep up. Victoria last year became the first Australian state to legalize assisted dying. But because Goodall is not terminally ill, he is not eligible. David. His daughter has been providing 24-hour care for her father so he doesn't have to go to a nursing home. She also knows she has to accept his decision even though she doesn't want to see her father go. He's lived um, uh, a really good 104 years and so, um, you know, whatever happens, whatever choices are made, um, they're up to him. The advocacy group Exit International, who raised money for Goodall's trip, will travel with the 104-year-old as he says his last goodbyes. And Goodall is ready when asked if he had a happy birthday. No, I'm not happy. I want to die. That report from Reuters, quite shocking. Anna Thomas, who's just arrived at the Six O'Clock News. So I wasn't expecting that. Well, well there was no. It was a fairly definitive end, so to speak. Uh, 
Lots of feedback coming in tonight. We really appreciate it. You can text us 2101, as many of you are and do, and we love hearing from you. And you can email checkpoint at radionz.co.nz. We are, of course, on Twitter and Facebook. The whole purpose of being on Facebook is to connect with a whole audience who haven't traditionally listened to RNZ or don't know anything really about it. So the stories that we attach pictures to aren't for people listening. They're for people who don't even really know what RNZ is. And we are getting to those people, which is exciting, by using Facebook and picture stories. You can watch, for example, our lead story from tonight on the Canterbury DHB. People are contacting us about that, so disgusted that the health boards have been treated like this. How dare the key and English governments do this to New Zealanders? I'm disgusted. New Zealand can and should do better. I am infuriated. Someone says, why did board members not speak out when this happened, said Stephen? Well, I didn't find out till quite a long time later, varying times later, weeks in some cases, months in others. We understand. Thank you for your feedback at six o'clock. RNZ News at 6 o'clock. Good evening, I'm Anna Thomas. It's been revealed that the chair of the cash-strapped Canterbury District Health Board allowed the Ministry of Health to write a letter for him in 2015, saying the DHB could manage within its existing funding. Information obtained by Checkpoint under the Official Information Act shows that in December 2015, the DHB's then-chairman, Murray Cleverley, sent a letter to Jonathan Coleman and Bill English, having received an identical draft of the letter from the Ministry of Health the previous day. A member of the Canterbury DHB board, Anna Crichton, told Checkpoint nobody on the board knew the letter had been sent. We'd been fighting for more money. We were in, we were in exceptional circumstances after the earthquake. Exceptional circumstances. And at no way would we have been able to work within our means on the budget that we had, and especially the capital budget. But Mr Cleverley says that sometimes, as chair, decisions have to be made alone. In actual fact, I think it's irrelevant who wrote it. It's actually what's important is who signed it. And so at the end of the day, I put my name to it, so I have to take some ownership for that letter. Former Canterbury DHB Chair Murray Cleverley and the Ministry of Health has confirmed to Checkpoint officials drafted the letter. The managing director of BP New Zealand rejects a suggestion by the energy minister that the company's pricing behaviour in the lower North Island is cynical. Megan Woods called the company to a meeting after a leaked internal email revealed BP raised petrol prices in towns near Ōtaki to compensate for losses in the Kapiti town. On her way into the meeting tonight, Debbie Boffer told media that BP operates in a highly competitive environment and stands by its actions in that region. She says the BP Ōtaki was operating at a level below what it would consider a sustainable return, but up in Navin and Kapiti, the stations were both heavily discounted. So the action that we, that BP took at that time, was to reduce the level of discounting across the Horofanua and Kapiti area and get us closer to that sustainable level of return. BP New Zealand's Managing Director Debbie Boffer. An unhappy parent says she supports drug education in schools but would not condone the use of material explaining how to use meth. Morgan Julian criticised Massey High School's use of the booklet, which includes safe ways to take the illegal drug. The school says the booklet was included as part of research material for a project investigating methamphetamine use. But Morgan Julian says it encourages teenagers to take drugs, which she says is addictive and can destroy families. Customers at a supermarket in Auckland say they're shocked at uh, the death of a security guard they say was a lovely man who enjoyed a joke. The guard was assaulted yesterday at a countdown supermarket in Papakura and died this morning. Shocked workers and customers say he was really friendly. Chatty and friendly and always made a laugh and always cracked a joke. Shock and sadness. I just can't imagine coming down here and not seeing, his, seeing him again and he had been working at the supermarket for eight months. A teenager made a tearful appearance in court this afternoon, charged with the manslaughter of the guard. The 17-year-old left the dock in tears after his family and supporters called out that they loved him. He shouted back, it was self-defence, as he left the room at the Papakura District Court, and he's been remanded in custody. 
A new report into a South Waikato prison says some prisoners are kept in their cells for up to 26 hours at a time. Corrections Chief Inspector Janice Adair has raised 42 points with Waikiria Prison after assessing it in July and August last year. Tom Fairley reports. Ms Adair found at-risk prisoners were routinely kept in their cells for 22 hours a day and at times up to 26 hours. She says one prisoner had become more focused on self-harm while locked up. Staffing was down with 21 vacant positions and one in three senior roles filled by others on secondment. The report also found the century-old high security facility is not suitable for the humane treatment of prisoners. After being closed in 2015, the facility had to be reopened to house the rising prison population. Correction says 30 of the issues are now resolved and the others are partially resolved. This is Tom Furley. The global fashion retailer Esprit is closing its six New Zealand stores by the end of the year, along with its 61 Australian outlets. About 30 people are employed at its stores in Auckland, Wellington, Mount Maunganui and Christchurch. Esprit's executive director Thomas Tang says the New Zealand and Australian operations have been running at a loss for some time. The director of operations uh, in New Zealand and Australia, Stephen Newnham, says the decision is unfortunate but unavoidable. Esprit gift cards will be honoured until the last store closes. It's five past six. The Hurricanes coach, Chris Boyd, admits it was a very difficult decision to leave utility back Vince Arsall out of their team for Saturday night's Super Rugby game against the Lions in Wellington. The return of All Blacks midfielder Ngani Lomape at second five means no place in the 23-man squad for Arsall, who was a standout in last weekend's 43-15 win over the Sunwolves. All Blacks wing Milner Scudder remains in a substitutes role after making his return from a prolonged injury layoff against the Sunwolves. And Benji Marshall's bid to return to Kiwi's Colours has the endorsement of New Zealand Rugby League team captain Adam Blair. Marshall and the West's Tigers face Blair and the Warriors in Auckland on Saturday night. Veteran half Marshall has turned back the clock and has returned to the Tigers. And Blair says his long-time teammate at club and test level is clearly motivated to end a six-year international absence. He's given himself every chance and he's never said no to the jersey. So, um, you know, if he's you know, in, the, in the right frame of mind and he's all keen and I guess he's playing footy and he finds uh, the opportunity, then I guess why not? Adam Blair. And the coach of the New Zealand men's basketball team, Paul Henare, has indicated the direction of the breakers were being taken by their new owners played a part in his unexpected departure from the club. Henare decided not to extend his time with the Auckland-based breakers after the end of their 2017-18 campaign. Speaking to Trackside Radio this morning, the former breakers guard said the direction the club was going under its new US-based owners was not for him. And that's the news. Tonight on Nights, Alison Balance investigates the irrational mind, pursuing things we know are bad for us, while quitting things that would do us good. The BBC looks at the future of cooperation, or is it every human for itself in the online world? And our cultural ambassador, Mona Lynn Quarteau, introduces us to four fabulous female singers from Latin America. And stay informed at the other end of the day. Join me for Lately, an hour-long show that includes the extended 10pm news bulletin and is across music, the arts, politics, live events and current affairs. Keep up to date with Lately with Karen Hay, 10 to 11 weeknights on RNZ National. And now the short forecast from Met Service to midnight tomorrow. Gisborne and Hawke's Bay, cloudy periods. Isolated light showers north of Wairoa and the remainder of the North Island, mainly fine weather with some high cloud tomorrow. For all the South Island, excluding Fiordland, fine apart from areas of cloud. And for Fiordland, mostly cloudy with isolated showers. And for the Chatham Islands, cloudy periods and the odd light shower. RNZ National, it's eight past six, and you're listening to Checkpoint with John Campbell. And Anna Thomas, thank you very much indeed. Anna, thank you everyone for being with us. A teenager has made a tearful appearance in court, charged with the manslaughter of a security guard at an Auckland supermarket. The 17-year-old who has name suppression has been charged with killing the security guard who died a day after police said he was hit by a single punch at Papakura Countdown. Staff and customers in the supermarket say they're in shock at the loss of a jovial, friendly and highly regarded man. Rowan Quinn is in Papakura. 
The teenager left the dock in tears after his family and supporters called out that they loved him. He returned the sentiment to them, also shouting it was self-defence as he left the room. In his brief appearance at the Papakura District Court, the 17-year-old was remanded in custody with an order he be kept away from adult prisoners. Just two doors down the road from the court, staff and customers at Papakura Countdown were coming to terms with the death of Goran Milosevic. This young woman who works at the supermarket says the kind and friendly man originally from Serbia didn't deserve to die. And he was like such a gentleman and he'd always be like willing to like talk to us and he'd like ask us how we were, he'd like ask what we've been up to and he'd also share about himself. Yeah, he was just like a really nice person. Yeah, really innocent. The store's manager didn't want to be interviewed, saying the incident was still too raw for his staff. In a statement, Countdown says it's deeply saddened by the tragic loss and no one should go to work and not return to their loved ones. Flowers are lying against the front of the store, close to where staff say Mr Milosevic collapsed. Some were put there by Diane, a customer who says she always loved seeing him. He was the loveliest of men. He um, was always chatty and friendly and always made her laugh and always cracked a joke. And this customer says she liked his hard case sense of humour. When I heard it, yeah. I couldn't believe it. And um, I'm fighting back now. I'm choked up. Mr Milosevic was contracted to the supermarket by Allied Security. Its managing director didn't want to comment, saying his priority was supporting his grieving family and colleagues. In Papakura for Checkpoint, Cor Rowan Quinn, DNA. Ten and a half past six from Papakura, we're going to Taranaki, where anger is growing at a proposal to pave over an Olympic-sized outdoor pool at the New Plymouth Aquatic Centre and fill in the diving pool as part of a $33 million revamp of the complex. Now, swimmers so long, summer days are spent at the outdoor pool. They're a rite of passage for people growing up in the city, while an elite coach says its loss would be devastating for the sport. What's going on here? Well, our excellent Taranaki reporter Robin Martin dipped his toes into the water to gauge reaction. The New Plymouth Aquatic Centre began life in 1903 as the Kawaroa saltwater baths set directly into the reef of the same name. The current 50 metre freshwater pool was built in 1963 and an adjoining indoor complex added in the mid 90s. The New Plymouth District Council says it now struggles to meet demand and a redevelopment featuring a dedicated 10 lane 25 metre indoor training pool is one of two flagship projects in its long-term plan consultation document. Mark Kenning swims often in the outdoor pool with its stunning view of the ocean until it closes each winter. He's reluctant to see it sacrificed. They do need another pool, absolutely. Um, they need an indoor pool, another one, but they need to have the keep the outdoor pool. There aren't many cities in New Zealand that have still got 50 metre pools outdoors. Um, Palmerston North's got one. Like, Tauranga, which has got over 110,000 people, they haven't got a 50 metre pool. So it's a rare asset. So um, we really should be looking after it. Regular swimmer Michelle Archer, who had just finished her training, says lazy days hanging out near the outdoor pool are a rite of passage for New Plymouth teens. I think it would be a real shame. It's so iconic out there. Like you say, we all grew up uh, swimming out there in the heat of the sun and um, I think it's just a real part of Taranaki. It would be such a shame to see it become a car park. Young mum, Courtney Carr, wants her son Taylor to enjoy the same facilities she has. We like doing the, in the, going in the outside pool, so yeah, we wouldn't really like to see to, for that to happen. What's your young man's name here? And this is Taylor. <laughs> so you'd like Taylor to be able to have that same experience and go in the outdoor pool? Yeah, yeah. The head coach of Team Aquablades, Sue Southgate, is fuming at the proposal. She says if the pool is scrapped, it would be a major setback for elite swimmers in New Plymouth. It is a great opportunity to do some long course training and that's massively important because all of our um, teams that go away um, are selected on long course swimming, not short course swimming. Miss Southgate says if the 50 metre pool is lost, her swimmers will have to travel elsewhere for long course training camps. She says the pool is recognised internationally. I've had quite a lot to do with the international triathlon community over the years as well. And they just love coming here and training in that outdoor pool in the summertime before the various international 
triathlons that they have here. They think it's one of the most beautiful training facilities that they come across in their trek around the world. Miss Southgate says it makes no sense to lose that in favour of car parking. The New Plymouth Mayor Neil Holdham says the Aquatic Centre revamp is only in the consultation document at the direction of the Auditor General. My preference would have been that we simply said, does the community want us to go out and do another flagship project? And that's a yes or no question. And then if so, what sort of project should we do? But the Auditor insisted that Council produce projects with costings. Mr Holdham says the council only had fully costed designs for a revamp of the city's indoor sports complex and the aquatic centre, but that those plans were not set in stone. Whichever flagship project ratepayers indicate they prefer, it's proposed that they would be paid in part through the sale of reserved land, including half of the city's only public golf course. Equally controversial, that idea finds little favour with swimmer Michelle Archer. No, I'm, I'm pretty against the selling of the land. I think, I'm not sure who said buy land, they're not making any, any more, so we only own so much, and, and to sell it off would be a real shame, and then to kind of throw the money away on something that's already great seems even more pointless. The Council's preferred flagship project is the $34 million redevelopment of New Plymouth's indoor sports arena rather than redoing the pool complex. Public submissions on the consultation document close next Wednesday. Ina mutu moti hotaka uti ahi ahi ko Robin Martin aho. I don't know if Robin took those photos today, but by golly, if he did, it was a beautiful day in Taranaki. It's uh, quarter past six. He did. Pip says, whoa. The Energy Minister, Megan Woods, says she remains unconvinced that motorists are getting a good deal after meeting with BP executives in the wake of a leaked email from the oil company about pricing. Now, as we know, the email showed BP raised prices in towns near Otaki to compensate for losses in the Kapiti town. Some lovely language being applied to this, but we tend to just try and play it straight. Three BP executives were called to meet with the Minister at Parliament this afternoon. On the way in, BP New Zealand Managing Director Debbie Boffer told media that the oil company operated in a highly competitive environment and stands by its actions in that region. Now, Megan Woods emerged from the meeting a short time ago. They offered me an explanation um, as to the emails that have obviously been a subject of a great deal of discussion this week. It's fair to say that my view remains as it was when I first read the MB report that people are quite possibly paying over the odds for their petrol when they go to the pump. Those reports pointed to the fact that we could be looking at hundreds of millions of dollars of wealth being transferred from the pockets of ordinary people into the tills of the fuel companies. And I still remain firmly of the view that we need to push on with the work that we're doing to ensure that people are being treated fairly when it comes to paying for their petrol. So um, in terms of next steps that we discussed with BP. Uh, we pointed to the fact that this government in its first six months has made a priority getting uh, that amending legislation to the Commerce Act underway. It's currently on the floor of the House um, and we should have the first reading of that completed in the coming weeks and sent off to Select Committee. I've also instructed my officials to begin a piece of work around a piece of empowering legislation um, so we're not going to wait till we finish the market study amendments um, and then the Commerce Commission chooses to look at fuel studies. We're going to be ready to go with an enabling piece of legislation that will allow us to make any regulatory changes that are required so that we won't have to wait unduly to do that. I have also given BP a letter and I will be writing to all the other fuel companies um, with a very similar letter letting them know what my intentions are. So BP was unfair to consumers? I remain convinced that what we're seeing here is an example of a market that isn't working for consumers. I think we've seen an example of some pretty cynical behaviour. I don't think this is isolated. I think this is exactly the kind of behaviour that led to the view that came out in the MB report that we are seeing the transfer of hundreds of millions of dollars out of consumers' pockets um, into the fuel companies, um, and we need to get to the bottom of this, and we need the Commerce Commission to have those market study powers. Isn't this just a competitive market and isn't, wouldn't the government then be actually meddling in that market? Look, I actually um, think this is an example of a broken market. A competitive market is actually one where um, players can come in freely um, and there can be competition and consumers benefit from that. What we're seeing is, a, uh, is an example of a fuel company, and I don't have any reason to believe this is isolated, um, where actually the, the price setting is going on to actually take the prices up to the, the highest level rather than give people the best deal 
feel that they could expect in a competitive market. Can you assure us that um, one of the powers you won't be exercising is price fixing? Oh, look, um, I am not considering legislating the price of petrol. I can give you that utter assurance. Megan Woods talking at a stand-up after her meeting with BP uh, a short time ago. It's 90 minutes past six now. The British political consultancy Cambridge Analytica, which has been at the centre of a Facebook data sharing scandal, has confirmed that it's shutting down with immediate effect. It's posted an angry and defiant statement on its website saying it's been vilified and that the constant media attention has driven customers away. It also insists its employees have acted ethically and lawfully. The BBC has sent us this report. It sold itself as the pioneer of a new kind of digital marketing, able to give companies and political campaigns unprecedented control over their message. But tonight, Cambridge Analytica bowed to the inevitable. The company, which denies any wrongdoing, received the data of some 87 million Facebook users via an app developer. It was the harvesting of that data which ultimately caused its undoing. But there has been additional public interest because of the boasts made by the company. In undercover filming for Channel 4 News, its most senior figures claimed they could decisively influence elections. In recent months, scrutiny of the company's practices has been remorseless. The London offices were raided by the Information Commissioner. People see the work that we did in a negative light. Its suave CEO, Alexander Nix, stepped down not long after a grilling by the Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee. Tonight, the committee's chairman said this wasn't the end of the matter. We've got to make sure that this is not an attempt to run and hide, uh, that these companies aren't closing down to try and avoid being rigorously investigated uh, for the allegations that have been made against them about the way they've used data, the ethics and the legality of their practices. Those investigations have to continue. We have to know what happened. In a statement, Cambridge Analytica said the scandal had driven away virtually all customers and suppliers, leaving the company no longer viable and now entering administration. Fallout from the controversy is global and ongoing. The founder and CEO of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, apologised in Washington last month for his company's failure to control the British firm. We didn't take a broad enough view of our responsibility, and that was a big mistake. And it was my mistake, and I'm sorry. Many analysts believe this scandal will have a lasting impact. This whole affair has, has changed people's perceptions of social media. We've drifted into the way that we use these tools without really a clear understanding of how that data is used and how we are ta targeted by advertisers. So this affair has, has helped to bring it front of mind for a lot of people and make people much more mindful about what they share. The company says it will honour its obligations to staff, but regulators on both sides of the Atlantic still think it has questions to answer. Amal Rajan with that report from the BBC. Uh, lots of feedback coming in. Mike says, for three terms we elected a government that campaigned on tax cuts and reduced government spending. We are responsible for what has happened at the Canterbury DHB. Thank you for your feedback tonight and every night. The revised Trans-Pacific Partnership is back in Parliament with the controversial deal now being scrutinised by MPs. Eleven submitters fronted up to the Parliamentary Committee hearing on the legislation for the first time with five for the Trade Pact and six against. Our economics correspondent Patrick O'Mara reports. Given the passion generated by the TPP, it perhaps wasn't surprising that the submitters fell into two distinct groups. Supportive exporters who focused very much on the trade benefits, while critical civil society groups concentrated on the loss of national sovereignty. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade kicked off proceedings with the lead negotiator, Vangelis Vitalis, saying the deal is a beacon for open markets at a time when many countries are erecting barriers. To give you a sense of what that is, 3,200 new protectionist measures have been installed uh, since the global financial crisis. Uh, and since 2015, we've had a 30% spike in protectionist measures. It's estimated the new TPP will result in $92 million in tariff savings as soon as the agreement comes into force, rising to at least $222 million a year once it's fully implemented. The other four pro-TPP submitters, such as Nick Curtin from Kiwifruit exporter Zespri, all emphasise that it would allow them to compete on a level platform against foreign rivals in lucrative markets like Japan. New Zealand kiwifruit growers paid $27 million worth of duties into Japan alone. 
And so the CPTPP will see these tariffs eliminated on entry into force, which is fantastic news for our growers. And this means we'll be able to maintain our competitive position in Japan, we'll be able to um, increase uh, marketing, innovation, investment for this market, and we'll be able to provide greater returns back to New Zealand growers. The Executive Director of the Dairy Companies Association of New Zealand, Kimberly Kruther, says Japanese butter lovers will also be relieved, given protection has led to limited supplies in the world's third biggest economy. Consumers will also look forward to some alleviation through the quota expansion um, to ensure that they, they don't need to continue the rationing of butter within their market, um, which has occurred in recent years. Hard to imagine um, that that's necessary in today's times. But TPP opponents are less focused on trade gains, which some think are minuscule anyway, and more worried about its effects on civil society and the government's right to regulate in the national interest. Rihanna Maxwell from the Wellington Justice Project questioned government assurances that Māori interests would be protected by the Treaty of Waitangi. Although the treaty does contain an exception clause which allows the Crown the ability to protect the interests of Māori guaranteed under the Treaty of Waitangi, international parties to the CPTPP also have the ability to challenge this in some circumstances which could limit its effect in protecting their rights. Oliver Hales from the anti-TPP network It's Our Future says the trade pact is being rushed through Parliament with indecent haste and with no proper analysis. MFAT's national interest analysis is incomplete and wrong in parts. There ought to have been independent sectoral analyses of the kind that the parties now in government called for when in opposition. We do have the institutional architecture to do that, whether it's sending stuff to the Productivity Commission, to the Privacy Commissioner, Human Rights Commission. The Select Committee asked few questions, though National MP and former Trade Minister Todd McClay consistently made the point that the new TPP was little changed from the old one. The government hopes to ratify the agreement by early next year at the latest. For Checkpoint, Patrick Amara. Uh, just before we move on, some more feedback. Last night we heard from Marilyn Waring. Tonight we have an old friend who has texted in. This is about the story we ran before six about David Goodall, who at 104 has basically had a guts full of life and is going to Switzerland uh, to die. Uh, our correspondent says, as to David Goodall wanting to die, I went to a fundraiser page set up to allow him to fly to Europe business class. It was already oversubscribed by some $3,000. I say, good on him. Nice to know there's a way out for him. And it's from Lloyd Scott in Wellington. Lloyd, it's really lovely to hear from you. We miss you and we hope you're well. Uh, 26 minutes past six. President Donald Trump's lawyer for the probe into alleged collusion between his election team and Russia has resigned. In the case's latest legal shake-up, Emmett Flood, who advised President Bill Clinton in impeachment proceedings 20 years ago, will assist Mr Trump with special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation into Russia's role in the 2016 election. Mr Flood replaces Ty Cobb as the question of whether Mr Trump will agree to an interview with Robert Mueller appears to be coming to a head. Boy, oh boy, this is the gift that keeps on giving this story, isn't it? Here's CNN's White House correspondent Jim Acosta with the details. It could be the most ominous shakeup on the Trump legal team yet. Ty Cobb, the White House lawyer who had counseled the president for months to stop attacking special counsel Robert Mueller, is out. Cobb told CNN, I've done what I came to do in terms of managing the White House response to the special counsel's requests. I'm extremely grateful to the president and chief of staff John Kelly for the opportunity to serve my country. But a source familiar with Cobb's departure tells CNN the White House lawyer was uncomfortable with the president's tweets hammering Mueller and wanted no part of a mudslinging campaign, making it clear he can't go down that path. Replacing Cobb, attorney Emmett Flood, who joins a legal team that has changed dramatically in recent weeks, adding former New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani and losing both Cobb and outside attorney John Dowd. Flood had worked on the legal team defending former President Bill Clinton against impeachment. It depends upon what the meaning of the word is. Yes. Democrats are pouncing on the latest chaos in Trump world. Nobody can stay around Donald Trump long who has a conscience and who has character and who believes in ethics. I think that's probably why Dowd left, that's why Ty Cobb left, and that's why Mr. Flood's time is limited. Yeah. President's latest tweets on the Mueller probe are a sign his legal team is getting more aggressive. Yeah. Hinting he could shut down the investigation, Mr. Trump tweeted, at some point I will have no choice but to use the powers granted to the presidency and get involved. 
The president is escalating his attacks on the Justice Department after Mueller warned earlier this year he may subpoena Mr. Trump to force his testimony. President Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, who oversees the Mueller probe, told CNN's Laura Jarrett his investigators are not backing down. There have been people who have been making threats privately and publicly uh, against me, and I think they should understand by now the Department of Justice is not going to be extorted. This latest shakeup comes after the president tweeted just last month that he was happy with his legal team, calling Ty Cobb, quote, his special counsel. All the indications now are pointing to the president's legal team becoming much more combative in dealing with the Russia investigation. As one source told CNN, playing nice hasn't gotten them anywhere. CNN's Jim Acosta doesn't have a beautiful way of delivering his scripts reporting from Washington. Just before we go tonight, tomato mushrooms, we don't know whether you've mobilized your mates or what's going on or whether you've got multiple cell phones. But we've heard from lots of people tonight saying, hey, the mushroom farm was there before the neighbors. Uh, hi, John and Team Worth to restate. I think that Tamata Mushrooms was there first. Those irate neighbouring residents chose to move in there and encroach on the farm. Or this one, the mushroom farm has been there forever. Why would you build a house next to it? Lots of people making that comment. They must like your mushrooms or be mates or just be people who uh, have a sense of um, first in or something. Anyway, I'll stop extemporising because therein lies trouble. Ladies and gentlemen, that is Checkpoint for tonight. Thank you so much for being with us. Rangi is fading up the theme underneath us. Listen to this, written by Lawrence Arabia. Lawrence Arabia, a.k.a. James Mill. Lovely man. Thanks for being with us. We'll be back tomorrow at 5. RNZ News headlines at 6.30. The chair of the cash-strapped Canterbury DHB has told Checkpoint he allowed the Ministry of Health to write a letter for him in 2015 saying the DHB could manage within its existing funding. Energy Minister Megan Woods has told journalists after a meeting with BP executives that we are seeing the transfer of hundreds of millions of dollars out of the pockets of consumers into the fuel companies. And the mother of a Massey high school student says she won't condone the use of a pamphlet explaining how to use meth, including safe ways to take the illegal drug. Our next news and weather is at 7. This Saturday morning, NBC journalist Katie Tour describes her front row seat at the craziest presidential campaign in US history. And the nastiest, possibly, medical museums, macabre freak shows or education.